Nyt on. Pistää vähän lisää tähän. Ei. Nyt. Hep, hep, hep. Joo.
Start slowly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good morning everyone. Sorry for the slight delay, but now we are ready to start. So in the lack of better alternative, I'll chair this uh, uh, session of the workshop. And we have um, uh, several uh, interesting presentations. We uh, formed this day as the academic day, though there will be also some presentations from research institutions. But anyway, in, in, um, um, in a, a slight contrast from yesterday, those are to be given by uh, professors or, uh, or uh, uh, academy uh, researchers. And because we are not going to have a final uh, question and answer session, so I will ask also the presenters to leave a, a few minutes for questions after uh, each presentation. So we have 20 minutes. Of course, we can allow to uh, have a few minutes uh, delay, but we should try to keep the schedule as uh, uh, correct as possible. And then uh, the first presentation is actually my presentation. Uh, it's about signal processing for 3D media, or um, it is still the title is, is saying 3D visual scene sensing, processing and visualization, which is um, uh, like on the same topic. So uh, what I also uh, spoke yesterday, our research motivation is to provide higher realism in representing visual scenes, to provide better interactivity with content, and to uh, develop new forms of communication and display. So when we use this uh, funny uh, picture from the Life magazine, we thought that it was very funny, but now with the uh, emergence of a new virtual reality headset, actually it looks quite... Um, quite realistic. Uh, this is our group, which I, I, I had. Uh, uh, beside me, there are two uh, doctors. One is a Marie Curie researcher from, uh, from Turkey. We have five doctoral students, two visiting researchers and four research students. And you can see uh, um, their, uh, their faces. Our core expertise 
is uh, a method for capture, processing, and display of real-world visual scene. Um, we try to develop knowledge about perception of depth and visual cues and uh, to address specific problems related with the massive amount of data to be processed and the optimal visualization on state-of-the-art 3D displays. Uh, so I'll try to cover the, uh, this, this field starting with the uh, uh, 3D scene capture. Here our main expertise is in multi-sensor capture. So this is uh, the case when we have a separate sensor for sensing the depth and then a sensor for sensing the, uh, the color or the texture. And this became a quite popular uh, case. Also, there are other groups uh, worldwide working on similar problems. Uh, our contribution here is that we uh, consider the case of uh, a so-called low sensing environment. One, when the depth sensor is with reduced power, uh, for example, sensors which are to be embedded in portable devices. Uh, we can speak, for example, for uh, a uh, single diode uh, uh, time of flight sensor uh, when the uh, result, the output of the sensor is very noisy. So we have to take specific care of the, of the noise in these low sensing conditions. Then usually the uh, depth modality comes with uh, lower resolution. So those sensors are usually 200 by 200 or something. We have to uh, up sample and to align them with the color modality in order to get the 3D scene uh, reconstruction. So this is, uh, the, the, those are the two problems, the noising and non-uniform resampling and multi-sensor fusion, which we are facing. Uh, uh, yesterday we had a demo of an end-to-end -end system for multi-sensor 3D capture. I hope people who uh, were here uh, were able to see this. And all these stages, they were working in, uh, in real time and providing um, uh, the, the, the result to an um, autostereoscopic display. So this is a um, uh, short demo, actually, about what is going on. So this is the, uh, the, the input, uh, which is, as you see, it's quite noisy. Uh, and, and then when we apply our denoising algorithm, we get uh, this kind of results. So it is... Uh, also quite uh, temporally consistent. And uh, the, the depth, depth modality here is uh, pseudo-colored, so different colors show different depths. And uh, this is the, uh, what we started from, the result of the, the noising and then uh, upscaling. And actually, this is the demo which we are showing yesterday. Uh, Uh, this is the screen of uh, autostereoscopic display, the Dimenko display. Uh, we provide the view plus depth when it is sensed and uh, upscaled. So we have the uh, two modalities and the display itself renders the uh, perspective view. So it has a hardware uh, rendering engine. So when we move the camera, you can see that the views are uh, uh, being changed according to the uh, uh, rendering result. But the important thing is that we can feed the display in real time with a dynamic scene. And one more uh, demo. So you can see the input depth. This is the resolution of the depth in respect to the whole scene. And this is the result of the uh, 3D scene reconstruction. And all problems that we have to solve, like the projection alignment, resampling, optical correction, denoising, upsampling, occlusion detection, uh, and all these things we are able to um, uh, implement in real time using some, uh, some GPU uh, and uh, OpenGL programming. Then we go to processing. And here I would like to present one of our uh, uh, recent method. It is about asymmetric view plus depth representation. So when we had to deal with this problem of uh, low resolution depth and high resolution uh, texture, we actually noticed that the depth itself 
uh, it's a modality which might be uh, good to present in low resolution. So uh, it comes anyway in low resolution from time of light sensors and we do our best to upsample it and to align it with the color modality. However, because it is a piecewise uh, uh, smooth function, we are thinking, okay, why we don't take the other, uh, the opposite path? Can we use the color uh, texture in order to, uh, to find an optimal representation of these modalities put together? Uh, and then we opted for what is called super pixels. So we wanted to uh, segment the color modality in terms of super pixels and then to use this segmentation for the uh, depth uh, uh, decimation or downsampling. Uh, we would rely on the capability of the super pixels to find homogeneous areas. And then when we impose, we would think that those homogeneous uh, regions are part of the same object. And why we, we favor the use of super pixels is because uh, they are kind of isotropic. So they, are, they behave like pixels. So it is not like the uh, segmentation we usually get, like the whole region, but this is something which can be interpreted uh, as a um, downsampled image itself. So basically, uh, uh, another uh, good thing is that the algorithm is reproducible. If you give the same color picture to the same algorithm, it will produce the same segmentation. So we don't have to keep or transmit information about the super pixels. So we can, we can um, impose different uh, number of super pixels and for each number of super pixels we can have different different coarseness of the depth representation and and then we have a reconstruction uh, filter which will reconstruct the depth given the color modality so it is kind of bilateral filter which tells us how to filter the uh, down sample the coarse uh, um, uh, depth representation in order to get it back and we can have this type of loop so we can optimize it given for example the bit budget or some other criterion so we can find the optimal super pixel segmentation and the optimal positions of the uh, depth samples within the, the segment, the optimal values because essentially we replace each uh, super pixel with one depth value and then we can get it kind of uh, isotropic image so it, it gets very, very small and then it can be further uh, compressed with any of the algorithms. It can be JPEG, LS or whatever uh, to, to do it. So with this, with this machinery, we are, we are very good actually. You can see this is resolution 20 pixels by 26. And then we are able to reconstruct the depth out of it with 30 dB uh, PKSNR compared to the original depth. So this is resolution 28 by 37. So we, we need only this small amount of uh, depth pixels to get to 32 dBs, for example, of the reconstructed depth. Then I go to another uh, example of our research. Uh, this is about real-time depth estimation and refinement and also free viewpoint interpolation. As we saw yesterday, free viewpoint is one of the things that it is essential in uh, immersive or virtual reality uh, applications. Here, our approach is the following. If we are given a few cameras and we want to render some intermediate view, we would use the plane sweeping approach to do this. And this is an example how it works for two cameras. Like we have only stereo camera and we want to render it here. So we take the, the point and we do the uh, projection having different depth hypothesis. So we say, okay, we think that this point is at depth Z1. If it is at depth Z1, it will project at this, at this point of the given cameras. If it is at Z2, it, Z0, it will project in some other points. So we build each of these depth hypotheses and as in the case of standard uh, uh, stereo matching, we form a cost, value, a cost volume uh, which I say uh, uh, naturally comes uh, noisy uh, and this is like how the cost volume is. We have a cost uh, defined as this and this is the unprocessed or unaggregated, non-aggregated cost which actually, yeah, it, it goes the 
irmãos. So you can see how it changed by from depth to depth. And then uh, we need to uh, filter it. And now the filtering, filtered results is much better. And then we do like the minimization along the, the uh, Z uh, coordinate in order to find the, the, the best uh, the, the candidate for the depth. So in this way, uh, in this way we are able to, uh, to uh, render the intermediate view. So and this is the result, like uh, those are all intermediate views between the two given uh, cameras. Uh, one thing that I wanted to comment here is that we don't have actually, the, the good thing of this approach is that we don't have holes. If we, for example, try to first estimate the depth and then use the depth for depth image-based rendering, then we'll, we'll have to handle occlusions or these things. Here, we don't have occlusions. Um, of course, some of the, of the estimates might be uh, uh, wrong. But anyway, at least perceptually, we, we, we don't see this. Now, another approach uh, is uh, if we still want to use uh, depth image-based rendering, and actually it would be the approach which will gen generate uh, better results and more trustful and more correct results, is to re really handle the disocclusions imposed by the uh, lack of information when we have to do it. Uh, now, we, we apply so-called layer disocclusion, and layering in our approach means that we always have two uh, layers, foreground and background, but those are not absolute, those are relative. So we, we, uh, we uh, split this, this is the, the splitting. So we have a local operator which goes and say in this domain what should be interpreted as a, a, a foreground and what should be interpreted as a background. And, and then we, uh, we take the same uh, type of mask which is binary uh, in the beginning and we, uh, we also render it with the desired uh, uh, position. So in this way, uh, we, we have some kind of uh, blending, which is similar to uh, alpha matting. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, this is the, the, the result of blending of the um, modalities. And now this is the result of the uh, rendering. This is with no hole filling. So you, you can see that when we change the perspective, we experience this, um, these occlusions. Uh, this is one of the um, state-of-the-art methods. So you can see uh, the artifacts which are uh, uh, generated when trying to uh, fill in the holes. And this is the uh, result of, uh, of our uh, rendering. So still we have some artifacts. Actually, this is a bit old video now. The results are better. But it still shows that uh, this uh, two-layer uh, disocclusion uh, approach uh, works, works quite fine. And then quite uh, a bit more fundamental approach. It's about light field capture and display. Here we try to uh, handle the planoptic function or its 4D uh, approximation. So in this approach, we, we are looking for new spectral representations. We are having also work based on uh, wave modeling, applying Fourier optics rather than ray optics to, to such systems. We are looking for combination of geometry and light field to improve the uh, results which are purely image based. Uh, Few words only for the planoptic function. You know that this is a very high dimensional 7D function. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, when we try to uh, use it in practice, we deal with its 4D approximation. So we put two parallel lines and we consider all rays which are coming through, through this, this line. So each ray is parameterized by two 
uh, coordinates in one plane, two coordinates by, in, the, in the other plane, so four coordinates in total. And this is quite convenient because it is associated with the camera plane and image plane. So we would have something like this, where each image will be a small image showing the scene for the corresponding perspective. So this is the kind of light field rep representation if we want to have a full parallax, both uh, horizontal and uh, vertical. And if we want to have only horizontal parallax and we look this like on, from the top, this would be the case. So we have the image play, we have the camera play, so it is like in the case of pinhole camera model. Uh, we have cameras distributed like by delta t and we have the sampling uh, b between pixels like, like delta v. And uh, 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 then uh, when we take all these images uh, in the light field representations, different depths, different objects and different depths will transform into lines if we put these two uh, planes in a one coordinate system. So if this is the plane V, if this is the plane T, if we uh, uh, take one point, it will appear as a line. If we take another point, it will appear as a, another line. And the slopes of the lines are depending on the depth. So different steepness of the slope uh, show different depth. And uh, what we will get in this case is a kind of representation which we call epipolar image. So this is like all possible um, uh, pixels and this, those are all possible camera positions. And then all points, they are forming lines. And if they are uh, the same uh, intensity points, they will form stripes with different slopes. Uh, this is how it looks in, in uh, a different view. So like we are moving the camera, we have three apples and they are seeing from different perspectives. Then we take the images and we stack together, we make a slice and we get, uh, get the epipolar image. It would be very nice if we have 100 cameras or more. So this is like the continuous case. We have the lines. However, when we have sparse cameras, we have something like this type of jack or staircase representation, which shows actually the allied version of the, of the light field. This was supposed to be the Fourier domain representation. The colors for some reason are alternated, but you can see that we, the, the, the same epipolar uh, lines, they appear as uh, lines in the Fourier domain. So actually the support of the light field in Fourier domain will be this fun type of function and when we have a uh, discrete amount of cameras and discrete pixels uh, the baseband gets uh, periodized so we have the principle the the baseband and we have all possible um, replicas which are which have to be uh, compensated or filtered out if we want to do a light field reconstruction and here we come to our first uh, problem or work. Uh, here is how to model a light field display from the point of view of the light field it generates. This is a, a, a brief description of the holographic uh, holovisual display we have upstairs and I hope you have seen it yesterday. So we have uh, optical engines, optical models which generates la uh, rays which hit a holographic screen. Now, for example, if you want to generate a point at this depth, you need to have rays which are visible for all possible positions. If you want to generate point at some other depth, you need to have rays at this position. Now, we can consider the rays as a discrete delta or uh, impulses. And what the holographic screen does is actually it uh, reconstructs the continuous light field. So it has, in a sense, it works like a, a uh, discrete to analog converter. After it, you get a continuous light field. So it is like this. Each ray is reproduced by a tiny beam and you get a continuous field. So when you move around the, the, the display, you don't see these usual bands between views, which is characteristic for autostereoscopic display. So this is true light field display. Um, now, those are the, the functions of, the, the, this is the description of the screen, how it behaves with respect to each ray. So it is a kind of bell shape or Gaussian-like uh, behavior. 
And this is the, uh, the, the same picture, just uh, a bit changed. So this is uh, the plane where the uh, optical engines are placed. This is the screen plane. And when we have a ray, it starts this being uh, propagated according to this equation. So this essentially will change the sampling pattern at the ray space. So remember we have these two, two planes. Equally well we can use the plane of the projectors and the angle. So this is another way to parameterize the light field or the ray space in ray space domain. So if this is the, the sampling pattern at the um, plane of the optical engines, uh, it will change when the rays hit the screen plane. And this is a zoomed version, how it looks like. So it is a non-rectangular grid. It, it continues further and to the viewer plane, it gets like this. So we have the shearing operator acting on all rays. Uh, and uh, this is an example of what happens actually on, on the images. So those are the images generated by the optical engines. So they are image-like, but they have been rearranged in order to produce the light field, to produce all points that we wanted to see uh, at the uh, plane of the screen. So like we, you can consider it as an image, but it has been uh, somehow rearranged. And they also have this characteristic of epipolar uh, uh, lines which for different projectors they are with different um, shapes and then when we go they you see at different depth this changes like this now the tool which we are using is the uh, multi-dimensional sampling or the uh, notation of lattices and Voronoi cells so basically uh, at the cameras the ray space is uh, uh, sampled like this and what we want actually to do in order to find the optimal camera placement is to match the sampling pattern coming from the optical edges at the display and coming from the, uh, from the cameras. And if they can match, then we'll know that we have the uh, correct amount of cameras producing the same light field, the light field with the same bandwidth in Fourier domain. So there is a, a kind of uh, optimization procedure which finds the minimum and uh, this is not unique, so you can vary with the resolution of the cameras and the placement between cameras. But eventually, quite good fit can be done. And then this would be the, the, the best camera placement. However, this is done against, again uh, following the uh, band limited model. So it is like in um, the following the uh, Shannon theorem. So it means that you need to have actually a very dense sampled field and you, you should anti-alias it and then take the proper cameras which will uh, be given to the display in order to generate the same light field. Uh, this is another work which goes beyond the uh, band limited sampling theory and it considers the uh, specification in, in the uh, epipolar image domain. So basically what we, what we want to do is to reconstruct the light field from a sparse number of cameras. So taking, getting the sparse number of cameras, the light field will be already uh, aliased um, uh, with respect to the band limited model, but we'll, uh, still we want to be able to, uh, uh, to, to reconstruct it relying on the fact that this uh, uh, function is sparse in some domain. And it is sparse actually in the domain of shearlets. So shearlets are a kind of basis functions which have, uh, in our construction, they have compact support both in spatial and frequency domain. So if this is the frequency representation that I showed you earlier, this will be one shearlet. So it is the tile, the frequency support of the shearlet here. This will be another one. So uh, actually it's a combination. We have a band, uh, um, a low pass function uh, working in this area and then uh, uh, those are the shearlets. Those are oriented basis functions. So therefore we call them shearlets. So they, uh, uh, they, they are supposed to cover the, the uh, frequency domain representation of the light field. And then uh, when we have this representation, we can run an iterative procedure 
in order to find those which are best represented for the uh, uh, for the given function. So those are the set of captured views. So those are uh, not uh, very many. Uh, this is the procedure uh, which uh, which finds the uh, the representation. So basically, this is the um, cost function, which is uh, based on uh, L0 norm, which which provides the sparse re uh, representation. And then uh, what we do is when we have the uh, current iteration, we have a kind of regularization or uh, hard thresholding in order to uh, prepare the function for the uh, for the next iteration. And this is actually what happens. So we, uh, this is the epipolar plane and those are the given cameras. So you see we are like, uh, we are missing 34 views. So this is like the decimation ratio is 34. We need to, d to generate 32 uh, view intermediate views here. Uh, and starting with the given cameras. And then um, this shows the successive iterations. Not used of this computer and always lose the mouse. So you see that we start with very, something very uh, uh, rough and then um, and then at the end after uh, sufficient number of iterations we get almost perfect reconstruction of the epipolar plane. And now this would um, show what is going on. So those are the input views so they are like jumping. This is the ground truth, this is the reconstructed. So out of this, we are able to, to get this. Another work is again related with multi-camera, but here we want to deal with the depth. Again, we favor the uh, plane sweeping approach and our aim here is to make it as fast as possible for, for example, real-time implementations. Robert is showing me that I'm out of time. So I will just refer to basically to this paper which was already published in IEEE ICIP uh, at the end of September and I can give you more details later on. But uh, uh, what is important is that our method is pretty much constant along with the number of depth planes we consider. So if we get the classical plane sweeping, <coughs> it is quite uh, good for small number of planes, but uh, uh, then it, uh, it gets much uh, higher for, for uh, uh, increasing the number of planes. So this shows the surface orientations, this shows the number of cameras we, we use. While we are pretty constant and pretty low in this, based on some uh, clever resampling of the cost volume which we formed. Uh, this is just to uh, advertise the center we opened yesterday for people who are today for the uh, first time. Uh, and this is like our 3D media group at a glance. Probably you already got uh, some idea what we are aiming at. And this ends my presentation. Thank you very much. Maybe one question. Thank you very much. Um, my question is, can you extend your approach for the API image chillet analysis to a two-dimensional camera array? Yes, we can, yes. Yeah. Basically, now we are doing it as a brute force, so we are doing it in one dimension and then in the other. But uh, 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 this is our current work to extend it to a full parallax. Okay, okay now the... Uh,
second presentation is already on the screen. I'm pleased to uh, introduce Martin Sjörström from uh, Mid Sweden University. And he is going to speak about realistic 3D technology to produce a lifelike experience. Thank you. Okay. And I have about one minute <laughs> to finish. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm Morten Sjöström. I work at the Mid-Sweden University uh, uh, and we have a research group that we call Multiprocessing and Imaging. Today I'm going to talk to you about realistic 3D technology to produce a, a life-life experience. And these are the things that I'm going to talk about. First, I'm going to present the university very shortly. I'm going to talk about technologies to produce realistic 3D and I'm going to mention three problems and three solutions. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little about the full parallax imaging project that we're starting now. We are uh, eight uh, partners here in Europe, so we'll have a meeting today. So, and then we're going to contribute with modeling and compression. <coughs> so I'm in Sweden University, the neighbor country of Finland, on the other side of the Baltic. Uh, Mid-Sweden means that it's in the center. So there we are. And we have active three campuses today. Hönesand will disappear next year, so we'll be moving to Sundsvall, so we'll only have two campuses. We have about 13,000 students, which is about 7,000 uh, full-time equivalents. A few bachelor's and master programs, we have 1,000 employees, of which we have 90 professors and then approximately 193 PhD students. And then there is the turnover in Swedish grounds. So this is our research group. Uh, we are four senior researchers and we are between two and four PhD students normally and they s switch over time. So actually the, the image there is not correct. I have a beard today and uh, we also have uh, these PhD students are finished. We focus on modeling of imaging systems. Uh, we processing of multidimensional data, 3D video uh, uh, and so on compression of multidimensional image and video, and also quality assessment. We have a very nice laboratory. We have a lot of different equipment. We have different kind of displays. We have different kinds of cameras. Those are uh, planoptic cameras. There are 3D cameras. There are range cameras. We have measurement uh, equipment so we can test uh, different things. And we can also change the lighting so we have all of the uh, standardization uh, assessment uh, the assessment uh, standardization recommendations, I should say. So, today I'm going to talk about what we call realistic 3D. So, 3D that you can experience as if you were there. And we see this as a natural extension in a strive for, for an authentic presence, authentic telepresence. And it gives a greater experience. So, it has been used quite a lot in media, which is where it started, and it's a very uh, driving force for, uh, for, uh, for uh, media. Uh, and then we have that also realistic 3D as a truthful presentation that gives a better foundation for, so it gives a foundation for a better understanding and a better assessment, meaning that you can use this to, to under, uh, investigate things too, to steer and control, to monitor things. <coughs> so the applications there are, are, first of all in media, of course, it's not like that. Uh, but also have medical applications where you have to be assessing what, what you see, uh, understand what is actually you, be, uh, you, you are investigating. And we did some tests with medical doctors a few years ago. Now industry, uh, uh, pro uh, processing industry is interesting in this because they can assess how they actually steer things when they don't want to be in the same place as what they are steering. Now when we talk about realistic 3D, we look from capture to presentation because we have to understand the whole processing chain in order to uh, give a good quality at the end. So this guy sitting over here, he, he uh, receives information from the 3D world through the capture. So how do we do the capture? They must be processed. Atana spoke a little bit of processing and quite a lot about processing. You have to distribute this over some kind of network and then you have to render it and display it as well. And eventually, this guy has to look at it and he says, yeah, it looks good. And I guess that most of you sitting in this room today, you know that how we experience the, the realistic 3D. We, there is oh, different depth cues, both such that you can see on a normal TV, like perspectives, shading, and so on. 
but also the, the binocular where you have two eyes so you can actually, by combining this information in your brain, you, you can see the, the range. So in order to, to experience this, you have to have a stereoscopic display at least, so you can have one image to each eye. You preferably should also have a quite a wide screen in order to, to have an immersive experience. You see all the side information as well out here, although you cannot really experience depth here, you, you see it. One thing to make it realistic is also to, to have the motion parallax. You know, owls, they, they look like this, and this because they can then see what is close and far away. And then you need some um, multi stereoscopic displays. Uh, and then it, what happens then is that, that the information is directed into different directions into the room. So one information is coming to your left eye and one to the right eye and you can experience this. And it, also if you move, you have two new views, so you have this motion parallax as well. The cost is that you reduce spatial resolution normally, unless you have a lot of pixels behind or if you have other uh, uh, technology where you, you can actually produce more. What is good that you can have this motion parallax, that's what I want to, to show with this image, and you become happy. Now, the next step is the light field displays. Uh, I guess those of you who were here yesterday, you listened to Tibor Balog presenting their work. Uh, it has a high spatial and angular resolution. So you don't really see any jumps between views. It's very smooth and nice, and you, so it's all depending on where you view. But if you should be um, accurate, there's a difference between multi-view and light field rendering. And this is what I want to illustrate with this image here. This is a, a multi-view uh, um, rendering, meaning that the system here and the information is rendered such that if you look here, you have a very good resolution spatially. And you have it here as well and here as well. But in between, the quality is very bad. Here instead, you have distributed the same amount of information more equally. So you have a less resolution in each place, but you have a more equal quality. The advantage of this is that you can actually move around in this space and, and look. So if you move forward here and you look here, you have the light rays coming in the way they are actually in the room so that you will have a new perspective here that is how it would look like if you were in that place in the room. So that makes it more realistic. So if you capture this, what you do, you either have a lot of cameras next to one another. So this is what we call multi-view video. If you have extreme, you call it light field capture with cameras. The alternative is, of course, that you also measure the range directly. You can do that by correspondences between uh, RGB cameras, or you can use a range camera like this one. The advantage here is, of course, that you Condense information, it's very easy to distribute it to the, the receiver. And it's also display agnostic in the sense that independent of the display that you have, you can render the views that you need. So you all have the views that you need. Very good, this is not very new. Uh, but there are some problems. First of all, these range cameras and also the correspondences uh, if you have multiple cameras, have very low resolution. So if you, we take this combination where we have a, a normal camera and a range camera, oops, there. This is the difference in size resolution. The pixels of this one is the same as this one. So you see this is about 65 times more information. And you need the one-to-one -one correspondence here in order to render the images. <coughs> so you have to somehow enlarge this. And if you do that directly, you get a very bad quality. Then you will have a bad rendering of new images. And we don't want that. So, the solution is a depth-guided upscaling. Oh, sorry, it should be uh, RGB-guided upscaling. So, this is the information we start with. We have those two from the two cameras. The first thing we do is that we project this depth information onto the size of this one in the correct place. So it depends on the placement of the cameras, the lenses and so on. So it will look approximately like this. We also take away all the edges 
So this is closer to the, uh, the camera and this is farther away. And we take away the edges. And why do we do that? Because that is very uncertain information. We have calculated how uncertain it is under certain assumptions. Depends how far away the cameras are, how much noise you have in the, uh, in the measurements and so on. The next thing we do is actually that we, we take look at the edges in the depth camera and we compare it to the edges here. So we know that these are actually edges that exist both here and there and then we say those are the edges that are belong to different objects. And by doing so we can diffuse the information between here to fill the whole space. And the diffusion we do based on how probable how uh, reliable this information is. And then we get to something like this. And this we can use to render the, the images. Now, that was the solution to the first problem. Second problem is disocclusion. And Athanas mentioned this as well. If you have a camera like this, this is what you see. If you use the depth information for that and you render a new view, you see that you have disocclusions here. There is no information and there's no way in the world that you can actually know what is there. We don't simply don't have that, so it's an ill post problem. So we have to somehow guess this. And one simple way of doing it is just to interpolate between these. And that works very well if the hole is small. Then uh, also the displays usually diffuse this a little bit. You can't even see that you have filled the holes. If the hole is larger, you have to find a way of actually filling this with a, a proper information that when you look at it, it looks good. And how do you do that? We go to the solution number two, which is depth guided in painting. In painting, you probably have tried in, in, uh, in, um, uh, in some programs saying that, okay, I have, a, I have to take away something and then please fill it with, with proper information. So what it does, it looks in the rest of the image to find information that we can uh, paste here and fill it. Now, since these are different depths, this is closer to the camera and this is farther away, we we'll have to be assured that when we look for the things, we look for the things in the background and not in the foreground and, and those comparisons are correct. We also have to make sure that we start at places where we have a high uh, gradient. So we make sure that this gradient comes in in a proper way. And if we do that, we get this, it fills it and it looks quite good. This is information we did not have it before, but if you look, it looks good. This is actually one, one uh, first uh, algorithm we had. We have my, done better results now. And it looks like this. This is the warped view. The yellow is what is not there. It's the, the lacking information. You have some cracks. Those we usually just interpolate because we don't see those. And if you, if you just do interpolation for the, the large using a, a, a method called the standard version of VSRS, it doesn't look very well. And then there are different methods proposed by different people. But what you can notice here, in this special case, she has the hand in front of her body. So you actually have three depths, her hand, her body, and the background. And when you look from another direction, this becomes a hole because you didn't see this part. And then it's filled with the background. So you see the background through her body. Suddenly she has a hole in her body. So you have to take that into your algorithm. So we made a layered approach. So we, we uh, in paint in layers. And by doing so, we come to this result. So we, have the, we take away the hole. It's not perfect on the edges, but at least we solve that problem. So that was the solution to problem number two. Now, problem number three is we want to transmit this and we don't want to uh, use as little space as possible. Uh, if you take this image, you can see that uh, the date has a very different distribution than a normal image. This is fairly smooth, a big jump, and it's fairly smooth. So if you use normal uh, compression like for uh, normal images, you've got edges that becomes very smooth. And that is a problem. When you render this with the smooth edges, it doesn't look very well. So this is the original depth and this is the, the compressed depth with a standard, I think it's uh, HEVC uh, compression. So instead what we have done is, is that we have looked 
into the edges, to identify the edges. We save the information on each side of the edges because here it's fairly smooth and on the other side it's fairly smooth. So we keep that, we subsample it along the edge and we keep that, we compress that and we send it to the other side and we do the, the inverse on the other side. We actually keep a few points on each side of the edge as well just to make sure that we have uh, the, the curvature of, of the smoothness. And when you do that, we get to the proposed scheme and then you can see that the, the edges are very sharp of the beam here, where it's a very, it doesn't look very nice if you use HEVC intra. So, we have a solution to, to the problem number three as well. Now, let me continue what we're going to do in this new project that's starting now. We have two, two, two early stage researchers. One is going to look into modeling and another one is going to look into compression. The modeling is going to look at geometrical optics and interperspective aliasing uh, for um, the light field systems and light field data. The second one is going to look into new formats and compression methods for uh, light field data. So, if you look at what we've done before, it's the modeling of a plan optic camera. This is a, a, a sketch of a plan optic camera. You have an image sensor, you have a lens letter array, and you have the main lens, and then you have some objects over here that you are taking pictures of. What we have done, we introduced a, a, what we call a light cone. So instead of just having one pixel and one ray in one direction, we look at several rays in, that comes into this cone. Actually, all rays that comes into this cone. We propagate this cone through the optical system and we get into the object space. So we have a light cone in the object space. If we do that for all pixels we have, we get a set of such light cones. And that is what we call the SPC model. This SPC model is very useful in the sense that you can predict the ability of the, the light field system, the light field capturing system. So one of the things, that, yeah, that's what I was supposed to say as well. <laughs> Why you use this uh, cone is because the focus properties are represented in angular span and you will have much better results. So what we did now is that we looked at lateral resolution. That means what resolution can you uh, measure at different distances from the camera. So this is how we, we measured it. We have this board where we can actually see the resolution and we move the camera so we can see. And uh, we measured it. It's the blue line. And then we used the SPC model to predict it. And you can see that a very good correspondence. The, there is the pink line, uh, line as well. There's an analytical. Uh, has done a lot of assumptions uh, that apparently doesn't fit so well with the reality. The other part that we're going to do in this is that we do some compression or coding. What we've done so far uh, is, among others, this coding of plane optic data by displacement intra. So we, we base the idea on the HEVC uh, and we say we want to code it within um, one image. So we want to predict this part here. This and this B we want to predict, and then we search in the area of L0 and L1 because that is, has, has already been uh, decoded. So we search there and we say, find something that looks similar to what we uh, want. And then we say the best of this we, we save and say we just have to remember the, the, the vector between those two. So either the mean of those or uh, one of those that we keep and we transmit that and on the other side we can actually re reconstruct it very easily. If we have a video we can also look into the previous and, and next frame to see if there is information that, that we used. If you do this and compare it to, this is JPEG 2000, the same compression ratio, uh, the HEV Sintra with the same compression ratio and we, this is what we have proposed. Uh, I hope you can see that the one we have proposed is sharper after rendering, so uh, it wor works very well. We have also proposed new formats to this, but uh, it becomes a bit complicated to explain, so if you want to know more about that, we can discuss it afterwards. We're very happy that our funders uh, give us some money so we can continue our work. And this is, concludes my presentation. Are there any questions?
okay, thank you very much. Since you finished 20 minutes ago, I don't know if we have time for <laughs> questions. <laughs> but maybe one question. Okay, so you know Morten, you can also uh, find him after the meeting outside and ask personal questions if needed. Thank you. Okay, next presentation comes from um, Fraunhofer IAS from Erlangen, uh, and it is about light field media, media production systems for enhanced creativity in post production. And I'm pleased to give the floor to Frederick Zilli. Thank you very much. Um, so, okay, very good. Um, yeah, I will talk about uh, our latest results uh, in terms of light field media production systems. Um, I'm from Fraunhofer IAS in Erlangen, Germany, and I'm heading the group Computational Imaging and Algorithms there. So this is a short overview about this talk. Uh, I will sh uh, show you um, how we capture light fields with our camera arrays. I will show you which visual effects for movie productions can be enabled by the technology. And um, then I will show you the first short movie uh, light field production called Coming Home, which we produced jointly with uh, Stuttgart Media University last year. So when you capture light fields, there are different um, yeah, systems which you can use. You can use microlens array-based cameras, such as from, from Raytrix. Um, you can use camera arrays. This is our approach here in this presentation. Or you can use um, multi-aperture cameras, which do not have a main optic. Uh, this, there are some emerging cameras from this field as well. But today, um, we will use this camera arrays. Um, so the reason is for movie production, you want to have uh, high resolution per camera. And um, however, you have, of course, some new challenges, such as, um, well, you need many cameras. Uh, you, in theory, you need a very dense sampling. And uh, so the cameras need to be small and still good and, and so on. And the amount of data you capture is, of course, also high. Um, so, generally speaking, there's this triangle uh, with contradictory goals about uh, camera arrays. You can uh, have viewpoint flexibility, image quality, or uh, efficient storage and resources, but not all at the same time. You can have a large array with lots of cameras, so you can really change your viewpoint dramatically. And uh, you have a nice image quality because you have a dense sampling but storage and resources is really a downside. Or you can go for a small array, say um, dense sampling still, but um, the viewpoint flexibility somehow lacks. Um, or you go to some kind of sparse array where you say, okay, I want to have that viewpoint flexibility and only a limited number of cameras, but then view interpolation becomes harder, uh, so it, it might impair the image quality. So this is just, as a general speaking, when you uh, want to acquire light fields with camera arrays. Um, so you have to adapt this usually to your dedicated application. So um, here for a um, production we did two years ago, or well, which we processed last year, we used an array with 16 cameras. And uh, to, to try out our processing chain, uh, and at that time, we were not able to capture videos. This is why we decided to do a stop motion production and uh, yeah, test, test uh, the, all this chain in the, in the first step. So we set up a plot for a so small uh, short movie uh, and um, well, had a scene set up, camera set up, did the shooting, and then the post production. I will show you some pictures about this. This is our studio in Erlangen. And here in the corner, we set up the scene for the stop motion production. Here's the 16 camera array, four by four cameras, some, some lighting, some background. 
Uh, this is in a little bit more detail. This was shot before Lego the movie came out. Yeah, so we claim somehow to be the inventors of, uh, yeah, nowadays Lego stop motion. Um, so here you see that that uh, person, which will be animated, um, yeah, manually by a, a student from a film university, and um, so there is a clip. There are, there are more frames, um, but this is captured by all 16 cameras, so you get the same clip uh, captured by 16 cameras. And, uh, well, now um, starts the image processing. It's about, um, first step, what we have to do is uh, rectification. So, of course, we did some rough alignment of the cameras, but you want to have a very precise uh, per pixel alignment such that um, the corresponding pixels are in the same image row and in the same image column at the same time uh, in order to ease the, the further processing, yes? So that you can uh, apply stereo depth estimation here and stereo depth estimation there and easily combine the disparity maps. So we have a dedicated multi-camera rectification algorithm for that which does this equalization. Um, then, well, it's all, on, only about finding the correspondences uh, which generate you depths or disparity maps um, in the first step, which can be filtered and filtered to enhance the quality doing, using uh, algorithms uh, as uh, proposed by, by Atanas and, and Martin and colleagues. And um, so uh, at the end, you can do some 3D reconstruction if you want. This is usually what we do not need for depth image-based rendering. We do not need a point cloud, but if you want, you can generate one. Um, so this is a colored uh, version of the disparity map, which we generate per frame and per view. Um, yes. So what, once you have that data, what effects can you apply? Um, so you can move the camera in X direction, Y direction, Z direction. So you can do some uh, free viewpoint rendering, uh, basically limited to the size of the array, but also uh, going in Z direction because you can combine the light rays according to light field rendering. So, and for post-production, there are effects such as vertigo effect or dolly zoom effect, matrix effect. You can create stereo pairs at uh, arbitrary interaction distance, and you can reposition the depth of field. And uh, we will see um, how this can be uh, managed. So um, we created um, plugins around our algorithms, uh, which can be used um, here, for instance, with an Avid Media Composer. And so uh, it's a very, very natural uh, way to use it for people in post-production. So you basically place the filter, and um, now here you can um, have a filter where you change the position in X. Um, and, and here, over the time, the camera moves with the video in X direction, yes? So you have set some keyframes, and you, here in the timeline you can go back and forth. And the parameters for the keyframes uh, tell the plugins uh, how far you want to move the camera, for instance. Or you can uh, change the position of the camera in X direction. Um, this is what we have seen right now. Uh, in Y direction, I'm sorry for the lower resolution. This is due to this VGA. Uh, you can see, it, this really with parallax, how, you can see how it moves. And also in, in Z direction, also we have captured an X and Y array. You can move it in, in Z direction um, because you have the full light reconstructed uh, using the geometry data which you acquired using disparity generation. And you can also change the focus from background to foreground or vice versa. Um, yes. And so um, there's one little thing. I, I promised the vertigo effect. So when you combine uh, a virtual dolly with a virtual zoom or digital zoom, then you get a dolly zoom. And you can parameterize this and you get here the vertigo, vertigo effect for stop motion data, which is, um, while well, quite difficult to achieve using traditional approaches. And uh, yeah, we can do this also 
not only in Avid Media Composer, but also in the Foundry's Nuke. And um, if we do the final rendering, uh, this looks like this. So here we have um, a virtual movement of the camera. So the array was fully static at the time of shooting. And here the camera moves from top left to bottom right, uh, and then to the left. And we pull the focus from the background to the foreground. And um, yeah, this is something what we can achieve. So now let me come to a, um, yeah, the latest production. This was um, about creating a short movie with a real actor, not a miniaturized scene like for the Lego. And we wanted to find out um, yeah, how, how can we go right now and not only in 10 years, but uh, is there a valuable use case and scenario for, for uh, yeah, using light field in a two days production? And um, so we <clears throat> had uh, lots of meetings with uh, ex experts and, and brainstormings. And um, so we tried a special setup with one hero camera here at Sony F3. Uh, a half transparent mirror as known from stereoscopic 3D and a behind a three by three Basler array. So this is how the uh, rig looks like without the mirror box. So here you have this cinema quality camera uh, and here you have um, the three by three array. And uh, as I said, we did this together with Stuttgart Media University um, yeah, in, in Stuttgart. Um, here another uh, making of picture. Here you see this with the mirror box. And the idea was really to get the best of both worlds, like having a high quality uh, camera so that um, you can guarantee that you have at least one uh, high quality 2D image. And if everything works fine with the algorithms, um, you can have a, a good depth map in addition for also for the zero camera or do some fun, fancy light field stuff. So here, this was a virtual, well, the, the set, uh, and here was the actor, and this was like a 70, 70s uh, hotel room with, with, with some actor doing some stuff. Uh, here you see it can be perfectly mounted on a dolly like you would do it for a 3D rig, and um, so it, it can be operated quite normally. Um, this is the actor, and um, I will skip that uh, due to um, time constrict, uh, restriction. Uh, I, will, I will show you how the node-based light field post-production looks like. So we have captured that content now. Um, so um, in the first step, we said we want to integrate it into existing uh, post-production pipelines. So, um, and this shall be used by non-experts or not computer vision experts. So we need an easy way uh, to process the data. And this starts obviously with the import of the data. So we wrote a dedicated plugin for importing multi-camera data. And just to give you uh, an idea about how it can look like. Um, so we say center camera is hero camera. We have a three by three array. You browse to the folder. This is which is also expected to, to be done by, by post-production um, creatives. And now the, the import process is um, automized. So you have online views here. Uh, they can be joined. You can toggle through the views. And so um, now everything works in this node-based workflow. Um, this is the first step. And the next step, you apply geometric corrections. Um, uh, basically, this is applying the rectification, which I have shown earlier. So um, you get. Here the footage, the uncorrected footage, and after correction, uh, all pixels are in the same image row or image column. Um, then you do some disparity estimation, and um, yeah, you will do this as well with a plug-in for the um, post-production software, and you can see everything in the graphical user interface. So here you have your joint views. You just grab a new plug-in. You say, okay, I have that three by three geometry as well. You can say, set up some metadata. You just connect it to the joint views. And then, um, yeah, the disparity estimation process is just started automatically. And uh, it creates disparity maps here now in the alpha channel. 
And this has the raw disparity maps as it comes from a block matcher. And they will be, um, yeah, filtered in, in different um, uh, steps. And um, depending on how much time you have, they, they, they get better and better. And um, you can, as, again, use all this uh, sophisticated uh, algorithms developed by the partners here in the network. And at the end, you will hopefully get some decent disparity maps. And well, now what can you do uh, with the disparity maps? Disparity maps are not perfect, yes. And the question is, are there use cases where you can achieve something useful already with non-perfect depth maps? And um, so we tried different, different uh, use cases. And one was depth-based color grading. And in depth-based color grading, um, this is a very forgiving approach. Here in the background, we will change the color temperature or the luminance without changing it for the foreground. And uh, yes, the disparity maps might have some, some bleeding pixels here, but it, you will not see it in the result. Yeah? So this application is totally um, yeah, forgiving for, for, for such an approach. You can see it again, um, pre-grade. And now in the background, you're going to change it. Um, you can render virtual cameras. Uh, I will show something, uh, another result on this later for uh, more of the few, few free viewpoint video. But again, this is another um, yeah, plugin which you connect to the view. And uh, you can also um, connect from outside the camera tracker inside Duke, which tells the plugin where to render that uh, virtual camera at. So if you had a camera tracker in, in before, like 3D equalizer or PF track, this can be combined. Um, you can do focus pulling in post production. So again, uh, here this is um, applied virtual bouquet uh, to, to, to this footage. That's known from light field cameras that this is possible. Uh, you can depth, do some depth space compositing. And here, the depth space were not yet um, perfect. Um, so you see that non-perfect depth map is a little bit noisy. We created a, a, a mask out of it. And now we use this instead of green screen for object segmentation. Uh, this is not this part of the sequence, but which the, the part will come now. We, uh, put another background in front of this foreground. Uh, this was a use case where you can see if your depth maps are not perfect, that, um, well, segmentation is, is not so forgiving. That's a learning. Um, but there was something else. And this came out in this uh, brainstorming with the students and the experts. This is about relighting. So once you have the depth maps, you can create normal maps. And when you have normal maps, you can apply um, workflows which are known from CG and to reposition uh, virtual light sources. So um, here this is uh, inside Nuke again. You can add a light source, a virtual light source to this footage and now uh, reposition that light source and make it, for instance, uh, turn around her head, yes? And if you do that, um, you get a rendering which is a, at least a very good start, I would say. Uh, so here you can see how, how the light source is um, rotating around her head. Um, it works quite fine if the light, force, light source comes from the front. If it comes from the background, you'll see some uh, segmentation maybe. Um, but at least if uh, you, you have some reasonable light source, it, it, it works very fine. And um, to underlie this, here we added a light source to an existing one. So here the actor is lighting a match. And we wanted to improve the, the luminance, the brightness of that flame, of that little flame. So we tracked in the video the position of that match, added the virtual light source, and created um, some added light. So it changes the lighting situation, not dramatically. And this is totally forgiving, and you will not see any artifact. Um, so you have, of course, reflections by his uh, body and his hand. And so this is the light which, which you add. And this can be also done totally interactive and uh, seamlessly uh, integrates into your post-production workflow. You can do also a combined relighting with CG and real content. So this is a um, CG teapot. 
Um, this is a real background in the real table, and you can do some, some rendering, um, and then you will see that that's a combined tree lighting, which um, can create, enhance the realism, and uh, this is also interesting for augmented reality applications. Okay, now I would like uh, to show you this video. Um, um, I will, I hope I have some sound. was applied to each scene, yes? So you can see which camera was used. It's basically always the camera array, except in the first scene where it was. It's a tough routine. Yeah. You go to your limits for the job. So you pretend to be a violinist. You don't wear your own clothes. Your credo, pretending, is everything. If they bust you, you're out. So you go to the opera as a fake musician, but not into the orchestra pit. You go to the toilet and wait. There's the target. Perfect view. Pull and fire. A glance over the shoulder. Was there anyone? Did anybody see you? You never know. It's an occupational hazard. One mistake and you're gone. The nurse should be blank, really. But you keep it calm when you drink Melliston tea. The tea for relaxed routine. Melliston tea. Drink tea, calm down. Yeah, this, this was the... Um short movie, and I, I think uh, I'm, I'm done here. Um, just one thing, because yesterday um, Atanas mentioned this, so he showed some picture, and I did a picture. Um, oh, sorry, just 10 seconds. And I did the picture. Of the DeLorean, yes. It is expected today at 4 p.m. 29 uh, in L.A. They, they have built up, uh, um, they are waiting for, for the DeLorean to arrive. And um, so this is from Back to the Future. And, uh, well, maybe it comes today, yeah. We are not sure yet, but cameras are observing the street in L.A. So let's have a look, yeah. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. One question. Uh, time consistency in your depth map. Yeah. Uh, how do you handle it? Well, here we did not apply uh, such a filter, but in this Lego movie, we applied a very simple um, effect to um, basically uh, detect changes in the RGB uh, image. This was possible there because the camera was static, and then we said, uh, change the depth map, please, only when some criteria are, are fulfilled, yeah? But this is definitely something where we have only a very, very first approach, and we, would, we are happy for new algorithms, yeah? Okay, we continue further with the program. And our next speaker is Reinhard Koch um, from University of Kiel. And uh, the talk is about 3D scene reconstruction and scene rendering from color and depth cameras. Okay, hello. Well, to make a long story short, I could go just to my conclusion page because everything has been said. <laughs> And uh, so this is uh, actually very much in the line of all the colleagues. Uh, this is maybe also why we found e each other, uh, that we know 
of course, that there are all these problems. We have solutions partially, but we are not there yet. So I still give you some, some information. First, some, some words about uh, my group. Uh, we are in Kiel, in Germany, and uh, I've been working in 3D for over now, I guess, 25 years. So, uh, and it's, I'm still not finished there. Uh, I've been working in all the EU projects, actually the frameworks from 3 to 7 to Horizon 2020. So uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, all the collaborations. And what is here? Okay. So the goals that I want to talk about is, uh, of course, 3D computer vision uh, for 3D scene analysis. And there are some, some important notices like how to handle this, make it fast, make it uh, really 3D. Uh, how can you apply it? And we have seen a lot of examples in the previous talks. Uh, this is uh, some uh, older work. Uh, if, for example, you have some 3D scene rendering from what we call structure for motion, uh, you can uh, do a reconstruction of uh, such a scene. That was actually from a, a European project. You can apply augmented reality do relighting of the scene so that it's uh, really fitting and stuff like that. But that is only applying to static scenes. And of course, much more interesting is dynamic scenes like moving persons. Uh, this is also quite some, now it's 10 years old uh, work on uh, virtual avatars. How can you uh, apply an avatar to such a model? This was a stereo mapping here. You see it's not perfect, but if you have uh, an avatar, you can fit it uh, to all the joints and uh, mimic basically the motion of, of this person. Uh, for that, you need uh, some good depth reconstruction. And at that time, it was quite hard to do it in real time. But then uh, was the advent of uh, 3D cameras. Uh, and uh, I will just jump uh, very shortly about this. Uh, I will actually skip this. Actually, 3D cameras, you have two different principles. The one is active triangulation, where you uh, project a pattern and then you fit it back and then you get some correspondences, all what we have seen before. And you get uh, what is very common today is now with the Kinect camera version one. Kinect version one has, oops, Something, yeah, it's running. Uh, you can see here that is a pattern, the infrared pattern, which you don't see in, in the real world. And here's a depth map. And you see also here you have this uh, occlusion patterns, the background, which is not seen from the other camera point of view. And of course, the other one, principle, which is now also implemented in the Kinect version 2 and in other time of flight cameras, is uh, the modulated uh, time of flight. So you project, uh, you, you uh, beam out uh, light, which is modulated with some frequency, amplitude modulated, it hits the object, comes back, you can measure the phase, and that's uh, how all these systems work that we have seen before also, which we call now nowadays time of flight cameras. There are a complete regime of different time of flight cameras. This is one of the principles. And this is how it uh, typically looks like. What we get here, this is an older type, there are newer types nowadays. Uh, this is again the depth image. You see, of course, it's quite noisy. So we have to do something about this. This would be the reflectance image, which gives some kind of confidence where could we measure and where could we not measure. For example, here you see confidence is low, the depth is bad. And this also has to be fused together. And uh, of course, that does not deliver us any information on color. Uh, but here, what we can do is, again, like uh, Morton also showed, we can fuse uh, color and depth. We have a color camera, forget this at the moment, just a normal camera, color camera and the depth image. And then you have to do quite good calibration. If you do a good calibration, then you can map the depth into the color image. And you could do it pixel by pixel. That might lead to these uh, gaps and artifacts or you do uh, intermediate modeling, like a mesh, uh, then you can get uh, up to the occlusion borders, uh, which appear because of the uh, baseline uh, between the two cameras. You can handle here uh, quite nice depths. And this uh, has to be done. If you do it correctly, you can do this very nicely. You just warp 
the depths uh, into the uh, color with all the distortions and then you have a perfect RGBD image but only from the point of view of the color image in that case if you go around you might lose because you have again a gap like an occlusion uh, gap you have to handle that as well and this can be done in real time on the GPU and this is actually our working horse I, I, I will show you some applications now uh, where we use this process of first uh, having a calibrated camera head uh, that can be just these two cameras it can be a complete multi camera head with many cameras many depth cameras and many color cameras and if you fuse them all together you can get quite some information out of the scene uh, uh, by mapping all this information into the color and depth map. This is this intermediate view. It's like a mesh which is distorted now because we look at it from a different field and point of view. Okay, and now this is what we call the depth compensated interpolation uh, and uh, we will have a lot of applications here that we can use. Uh, we can, uh, for example, if we have many cameras we can interpolate between the views. We have seen this results uh, from, from Fredek, for example. But if we have depths and we handle the occlusions correctly, we can also extrapolate to some certain extent. Then you have the problem of the occlusion holes. But you can invert the problem if you say, OK, the depth is needed, uh, like Morton showed. Uh, if you go away, you have uh, the uh, unknown background. But what if you, for example, put uh, more cameras, like depth cameras from here and here, then you can do everything, interpolation and background extrapolation at the same time. I will show you some results on this. And um, the one example is a toy example that we made a few years ago for generating a mixed reality or virtual studio. And you know all, uh, a virtual studio normally you have your blue or green background screen you cut out the objects uh, and we want to do this with depths we've seen a nice example just now uh, it's exactly the same technique and just take one depth camera like a time of flight camera and maybe one color camera uh, and put it on a on a mounted head that can sweep around then you can scan the room Okay, then you have a, an uh, interpretation of the room with color and depth. There you can already make 3D models, which is static. And then you continue by taking this model and adding a, an actor and tracking this actor with your camera head. And then you can integrate the moving actor with a pre-computed static background in 3D. And you can then add also objects, like virtual objects, uh, and do a lot of things like uh, lighting and stuff like that. And uh, I have uh, a small video that I want to show to you. Uh, here, uh, taking this head, for example, uh, you can generate a panoramic image of color and depth. And then you fuse them together, then you have a two point whatever, not full 3D, but two point something representation of the scene. It is correct from the point of view of the camera and it will not be correct if you move away but it gives a good estimate of depth. So let me, let me run now. Uh, I have put, uh, it's a bit longer video, I put it into a few chunks and I first show you how we generate our background model and then how we uh, put in, uh, for example, objects and do some lighting stuff and do some interaction. Let's see if it runs. Welcome to Mixin 3D, a flexible mixed reality approach using time of flight camera technology. Our goal is to mix real and virtual content, providing correct mutual occlusions, mutual shadowing, artificial reflections of real content, and interaction with virtual content. We therefore use a time of flight depth camera, a CCD camera, a fisheye camera as a post sensor, and a pentel unit for background model construction. The background model is constructed by performing a panoramic sweep with the pen tilt unit covering 120 by 80 degrees of the environment. While sweeping, the depth and color images are projected into two cylindrical panoramas using the angular information provided by the pen tilt unit. From these two panoramic images, a dense 3D mesh is constructed by triangulation. Yeah, of course, 
the impression and you can insert objects geometrically. In our I don't, I skip the tracking part. Uh, if you want to mix a very uh, simple mixture here, you can take the background model, you take the live foreground model of the actor and for example some virtual objects that also have depth and color and you can fuse them consistently. So if you do this, you can do some keying, you can some interpolation, and I show you now how to plug in geometric objects into that scene. What you will see here is looking a bit crude because I go and deviate away from the point of view of the real camera. In the video later, you always have the view of the real camera, but here for construction you show uh, how uh, content is generated. of real and virtual content requires a correct alignment between the two modalities. Therefore, we use the background model as reference and place the virtual objects relative to this background with interactive pick and place. A physics engine is finally used to drop the virtual models in their final positions. See, this is off, but it doesn't matter later because the point of view of the camera is never seen like this. It's only for geometry fitting with bullet. And uh, Oh yeah, no, I continue. Uh, can I run it? Ah, oh, sorry. Ah. A significant okay. advantage of our approach is the possibility of interaction of real dynamic foreground objects with virtual content. So what you can plug in is the real object, the, the virtual objects, and this is really interacting, it's hitting. The real object is hitting the objects. You can see this is a Therefore, background. Therefore, the geometry of background and dynamic foreground is represented as triangles and collisions are computed using a standard physics engine. This is behind the engine. Additionally, the shadow mapping provides a realistic perception of the whole scenery. You can see shadows cast on the person, on uh, the objects. And this can all be done with just a very simple setup in the normal camera, uh, uh, a computer. So, uh, this is one example how to use this as a tower. Now you use, uh, all can use this uh, if you go to Microsoft uh, with the games of uh, Kinect, for example. The other approach, which is nearer to what we have been doing here in the uh, form of the European projects and which will continue here, is uh, outer stereoscopic display uh, content generation. And you all know how that works. I will skip through this. The important thing is that what we want to do is we want to generate content for, for example, here, outer stereoscopic displays, uh, where we have 9 to 70 views. Uh, uh, and we can, this is one dimensional uh, horizontal parallax. You can also go uh, to realized displays, which are at the moment, of course, static, uh, but there is hope. Uh, and uh, this uh, was uh, explained yesterday. Uh, what we have here is a display which has a potential of 8 gigapixel, but only one image. But I have one video. I hope I have, uh, uh, it's okay if I show it to you, uh, to, to the audience, uh, where we filmed uh, this uh, uh, display of one square meter with a normal camera just moved around here. So this is the display. I have to shut this. And this is a display uh, that is standing in real eyes premises at the time. And you can see really nice parallax. It's only this flat, but you get really very good full parallax display. Uh, it has 250,000 images. Each image is a circular image. is about also 200,000 pixels. So it's quite big. And you can see moving around, very similar to, of course, what we see with holographic, but you can go in both directions. Uh, and if you do this stereoscopically, uh, you can also see this stereoscopically. So how can we generate all this data? I mean, this is really a challenge. And what we opted for, as was also said before, is depth-based content representation. So we take uh, color and depth and we mix them and then we try to generate the new data. Uh, uh, the data for all the cameras. For example, if you have a 70 view display, it's very hard, I mean, it's very costly to place 70 cameras. So uh, how can you do it with less? And uh, here what we used is the uh, format which was also presented shortly uh, before, it's the layer depth video. And the idea behind very shortly, you have again, 
your original camera, your foreground object and the background object where the object is hidden. So this is what the central view sees. And if you had the right cameras, you would see on the right and the left the disoccluded areas which appear here. You can never get them from the reference image. And this would be also very hard, uh, whereas Martin, to, to, to interpolate because you never see uh, in the original data that there was something hidden. So how can we estimate, not estimate it, but measure it? And uh, we use the two-layer representation here. You can extend it to more than two layers, where we have the foreground layer, which is a full 2.5D model, depth and color, as seen from the central camera, which is the main camera. And then we take additional helper cameras and we look behind the original object and we need therefore the depths also from the side. So what we do is, oops, what we do is here is one proposition which we had in our last European project 3 d for u This is a central camera and then we place not color cameras only but color and depth sets modules. This is a depth camera, this is depth camera and everything in between can be really interpolated even if it's hidden in the central image. And in order to get also the colors, we have here the color camera and so we have in this case a 5 plus 2 setup. It has to be calibrated well and then you can generate from this data. And the, the foreground data is relatively easy. What you do is you take two of these uh, images, these are the two depth camera images here, you fuse them because you have 3D information, you can easily fuse them with 3D, so you have one consistent depth map for the foreground first. So uh, this foreground mapping, uh, you can see now is short video clip, you can see here that it fits, but we have really made a soft transitions uh, in order to avoid the artifacts from looking around. So it's not very sharp, so we have to do something about this. Uh, and therefore, we use all the data. So we have our rig and these are the five <coughs> camera colors and the two depth cameras. And if you look closely here, for example, here is an, a person behind the second person. And if you look here, it's uncovering something, it's holding something. You can see it even better in the left camera and uh, depths. Here the person is fully <coughs> occluded and here you can see it has multiple layers because it's holding something in front. And how can you, if you then fuse all this data, uh, we can get all the information which is the foreground and the hidden background information. And for that we use again our working horse, the GPU based matching. Uh, we first generate from here to here and here a mapping so that we have color and depth here and here and here and here. It will be not fully complete because there is missing information. But then we can use these data to map them to the central view and we complete the data. I show you how this works. So we have here foreground and the occlusion color. You can see uh, it's a big area that is uh, missing in the foreground and you still want to get it. And so what we do is we generate these three uh, color depth maps which are incomplete and then we can do again warping from the central view to the left view and from the central view to the right view and there will be a difference which is exactly the occlusion area. In this occlusion area we can find now back in the other cameras and we complete. So now our system has foreground layer and the background layer. So that is a full two layer. It's not nothing extrapolated or guessed. It is measured. Uh, and I show you now then a small video. What would uh, the camera baseline see? In this case here, if we take this uh, two view LDV and we run it back and forth, we can see what one frame in a multi view display would look like. In this case, it's just nine views. And you can see that's quite nicely undisclosed uh, uh, you can see the occluded uh, area now in the left and right. You can see some errors because of color matching, stuff like that. Okay, this is another application and oops, some, yeah, that's, that's the last step. How can we apply this to our new project? Okay, and uh, 
think big, so we have a big system, we call it Igor, it's 2.5 meters long with 25 cameras, color cameras and it has depth cameras and we will exploit the same principle as I showed you just now to maybe generate a very dense light field and I'm really looking forward to play it on the Holographica display. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> That's Thank it. you. We are 20 minutes behind the schedule, so we can make it 30, so one question. Okay, thank you. Next speaker is Professor Manuel Martinez Corral from University of Valencia. And the talk is to be defined. <laughs> right. <laughs> so Manuel is professor in optics. So we expect to get some talk more on the way of uh, physics of formation of planoptic images and something going more toward integral imaging maybe. And, and, uh, and this is PowerPoint, this one, okay. Okay, capture and display of microscopic and macroscopic 3D images. Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, you know, uh, I am representing uh, the three-dimensional imaging and display laboratory at the University of Valencia. Uh, this, uh, this laboratory, this group, uh, is uh, co-head by myself and Professor Genaro Saavedra, who is also here in the room. Uh, we, are, we belong to the Faculty of Physics of the University, so in some way we are a little bit exotic in this, in this uh, engineering at atmosphere. Uh, uh, this is our group um, in a, okay, not very hard-working uh, moment. Uh, our group is uh, mainly also composed by, by physicists. And we have been, for the last uh, many years, we have been working in uh, 3D uh, imaging and display of uh, microscopic and macroscopic uh, object. And uh, concerning uh, microscopy, uh, we have been working in confocal microscopy, structural illumination microscopy, digital holographic microscopy. I will not speak about, about that. I will concentrate uh, my, my talk in the you know, in the, in the topics which are related to this uh, training network. So, in this sense, uh, the, the first topic I'm going to face is uh, how to apply the, you know, this very old Lippmann concept to the, to the application of, of, of microscopy. You know that the original idea of Liebman was obtaining uh, many uh, different perspectives of the same scene by use of a microlens array. So what we make here is, uh, is that we, we try to implement this in a, in, a, in a microscope. This technique, in fact, uh, maybe by many of all of you is known as, as a light field microscopy. In fact, I prefer to use the, the word integral microscopy because uh, in order to recognize Liebmann, Liebmann contribution to this, to this topic. And how, how can we build uh, an integral microscope? So it's, it's very easy, in fact. It's like a planoptic camera, but with a, with a, uh, with a big difference. So there is a, a, a telecentric arrangement, simply coupling, between the, the uh, objective and the tube lens. And then, in this sense, the relation between the microlens array and the aperture stop is a, a transposing relation, in the sense that the one is, is in the front focal plane of the, of the tube lens, the other is in the back focal plane. In this sense, for example, 
uh, with, this, with this integral microscope working with very small samples, what we obtain is a collection of usually uh, many microimages uh, and in any microimage behind of any of, of them uh, we have a small number of, 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 of pixels. So this is, this is the, you know, this is the presentation uh, of, the, of the radiance map, of the planoptic map. And uh, what we can, the, the most important issue here is that uh, by simply performing a transposition of this matrix, of this, uh, of this function, we can obtain uh, the perspective views, the, what we can call the, the elemental images. So by simply transposing of, uh, of, of this function of, or by simply taking the rows in this function, we can obtain different views. Then in this case, we have uh, only few views with many pixels each. And it is, uh, from my point of view, it is easier to work with, uh, uh, with this uh, second way of, 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 of having the information. And then from these orthographic views, it is easy to render the death, uh, render death images or uh, calculating death maps or, uh, okay. So, uh, ah, it's working, it's okay. So this is, a, this is a, my, uh, an experiment we did uh, similar to the experiment performed by Livoy some, some years ago. Then we have a, a, a fluorescence uh, sample and then we obtain it in the left, the collection of microimages, many microimages with a few pixels each. And then from them, it is very easy. We make the transposition. So uh, the right, the right hand uh, video is directly, uh, you know, a video of the transposition images, and we can render the deaf, deaf images from them. Which is the main problem of, uh, you know, planoptic technology, integral imaging technology. Main problem is that we lose resolution. Losing resolution is a big problem always, but in microscopy is a key problem. So, in fact, if you lose resolution, uh, this cannot work. So, so if you are implementing a technique in microscopy which is losing resolution, nobody will accept that. So then uh, we recently, uh, uh, this is an example, for example, uh, top left is a, you know, a direct image of a, of a, of a new SAF uh, test, right, Top right is the, the planoptic image. Here are the views obtained directly by, by transposition of, of, of the planoptic image. And uh, bottom right is the reconstruction. You can, you can see that reconstructed image uh, has poor resolution. So if you build a microscope with poor resolution, then this is not a microscope. This is an imaging system. So then our proposal was, uh, uh, was uh, simple, but I think effective. We propose uh, the, to increase the increasing of the resolution by physical interpolation. Physical interpolation, it means that, uh, I don't know if, if it can work one more time. Okay. Physical interpolation means that if you insert a parallel plate in the, in, the, in the path of the light, and you make this parallel plate oscillate that way very fast, you can obtain uh, two planoptic images shifted by half the pitch of the micro lens. Then you can obtain a planoptic map which is twice denser than the, pre than the previous. And in this way, you can multiply by two the resolution of the system. So, okay, this is, this is an example. I ha we have codified in different colors, two different views, and then in the right-hand side is the example of how to, how to interlace these views. And here is uh, some examples on uh, refocusing in different places and in which we show, if we compare with the previous one, that the resolution has increased uh, significantly. So we are still far from, uh, 
from the resolution that people from microscopy want, but we are in the way. And maybe here, I don't know if they work, yeah, some, some views. So in the left hand side, we can see, you know, uh, images of our biological samples, images in the left hand side, we have images obtained with the uh, integral microscope. And in the right hand side, we can see the images obtained uh, by using the physical interpolation. So we have, we obtain double resolution. This is good. I think this is still is not acceptable by people from microscopy. Then uh, our next idea is uh, to try to, to implement a different way of, of capturing the, the radiance map. Our idea is the following. Then our plan is to remove the microlens array and then to make a, a you know, windowing in the aperture plane of the microscope. In, in this way, for example, if we, if we uh, make this window in the, in the aperture stop, we can use all the resolution of the, of the sensor and then in this way we are capturing only one row but with much higher resolution. So, so you know, this is a conventional uh, integral microscope and this is the, the win window win, the aperture stop. I think I have here a, a, a movie. So if we implement some kind of, of, of uh, dynamic system for windowing the, the aperture stop of the microscope, uh, for example, that way, then uh, we will be able uh, to obtain many, uh, let's say, orthographic views of the sample with a very high spatial resolution. Then the combination of them, I'm sure we still don't have results of this, but the combination of this, I, I, I think, uh, will provide, finally, uh, integral microscopy images with a good resolution, with capacity of generating uh, views, and with capacity of making this depth rendering. So, in fact, uh, one of the uh, ESR that is coming in, uh, to our lab will be developing this system. So, another of our proposals is, uh, is uh, related with uh, making a different, maybe novel, uh, ways of performing the depth rendering. So, and then here we take profit from we take profit from something that is uh, very simple and that is evident is that, for example, if we, have a, if we have an object, the red one, which is uh, for a given distance from the, our uh, collection of, of, of camera, then we find that this object uh, provides some, you know, copy of, of it at different distances. So we can define, we can define a point spread function for associated to any depth distance. In this way, for example, if we have uh, two objects, the red and the blue ones, we find that uh, they provide copies in the, in, the, in the detector, but with different distance between them. The parallax is different. The disparity is different. Then in this way, for example, from a collection of elemental images, we can select uh, three by three of them, and we can, we can apply a deconvolution algorithm, and depending on the period of the periodic, let's say, point spread function, we reconstruct in one plane or different plane. So you can see that uh, we don't make reconstruction plus deconvolution. We make simply deconvolution. The deconvolution directly provides the depth rendering. So our idea is to go further, uh, and this will be another of the topics related with this, uh, with this network, our idea is to go further and substitute this, uh, let's say, point-like, 
point threat function by periodic point threat function that take into account the diffraction effect. In this way, I think we will be able to obtain much better results. Anyway, this technique is able to, you know, allow some extra digital processing. For example, uh, top left, we can reconstruct simultaneously in two different planes. For example, the plane of teacher and the plane of, of Albert and are simultaneously. Or, for example, we can make an all-in-focus image in the bottom right. And to finish, I would like to uh, speak about a, a technique which is somehow related with things we have seen here uh, this morning, maybe the talk by, by, by Sili from, from, from Fraunhofer Institute. Uh, we want to make also some processing from, let's say, the collection of elemental images obtained with an array of, of, of camera. So our proposal is the following. We can make refocus, we can change uh, the viewing angle, we can change the center of the field of view, but for that we don't need to calculate a disparity map, we don't need to calculate red map, uh, death map, our proposal is, okay, I would say simple. We simply propose to fix windows in the, in, the, in the collection of elemental images and we need to fix the window size and the windows position here. And fixing these two parameters, we can select at will uh, uh, fixing this parameter are, are, and cropping these images, we can fix at will many parameters of the, of the display. So then we can, you know, we can make something like this. So if we can, we can shift the, the window center or we can make the window bigger and smaller. And okay, so these are, these are examples. So from From this collection of elemental images, by simply changing this parameter, we can calculate, for example, this, in which uh, uh, top left is the collection of micro images calculated from the elemental images that are projected here in the monitor. So this is a, an iPad in which you, we put uh, a micro lens array. Uh, for example, in this case, our decision was, uh, you know, uh, the viewing angle. But, for example, in, uh, in, the, in the right, we decided to uh, enlarge the viewing angle. So, you know, to go closer to the scene. And in this case, we decided to change, uh, you know, this is providing real 3D. So, in fact, uh, if you are here, you can, you know, you can touch. So here we decided that uh, the cook here is, the, is in the plane of the micro lenses, but here the, in the plane of the micro lenses was the window and the cook was outside. So we can decide all of this and for this decision we simply need to, you know, to crop and transpose the uh, planoptic information. Uh, I think I have only two more. Uh, uh, and we also can make movies. So from, uh, you know, Lego is always present here. Uh, from the same collection of elemental images, we can calculate all of this by simply moving the window by which we crop the elemental images. And then, of course, we can project this in, a, in, a, in our uh, integral imaging monitor. So we have, a, uh, we have a movie which has a full parallax and then we decide which part of the scene is, uh, you know, behind the monitor, which part is in front of the monitor, which is in focus, which is out of focus, from a single collection of uh, elemental images. And to finish, okay, let me uh, say a few things about our laboratory or our university. 
So University of Valencia is a, a medieval university. It was founded uh, more than 500 years ago. Uh, within this university, Faculty of Physics, uh, I would like to remark that we are ranked uh, among the you know, top 100 universities in, in, in the world in physics. Yeah, in fact, our faculty is very famous in Spain, so we receive students from, from everywhere in Spain because of this, because we are, we are famous. So there is a, also a rank in Spain, and, and, and we, are, yeah, we are in the number one in Spain uh, from Spanish point of view. And uh, the PhD program in which, uh, you know, uh, these candidates will be enrolled uh, has been recognized by, by our Ministry of Education with the excellence mention. Uh, concerning our group, uh, in the past uh, seven years, five of our students have finished their, their, their uh, PhD thesis, two of them obtaining the, the best thesis award in physics. Uh, at the moment, uh, five students are still working in their thesis project in our last, in our lab. We hope in, in the next few months we will have seven. And, uh, okay, in the last 10 years we, ha we have published uh, about, uh, in average, six, seven papers per year in high-ranked journals. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Until we exchange the uh, presentation computers. Okay, if not, thank you once again. <laughs> and let me introduce the, uh, the next speaker. It's Professor Xiaowei Sam from the Nanyang Technological University of Singapore. Uh, our colleagues there, they run a similar project which is called Toward the Reality of 3D Imaging. And uh, together with uh, Dr. Phil Sermon, they will give two presentations uh, about their project and the research they are um, uh, conducting uh, under this uh, project umbrella. Okay, please. Thanks for the invitation uh, for us to come here. Uh, as you can see, I'm from Nanyang Technology University. It's now muted. It's not muted. Okay. Yes, okay. now it should be okay. Hello? Okay. Um, I'm from Singapore. It's a very uh, hot place. So it's uh, summer every year. Right now it's about 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, so it's a, a big crunching for me. Uh, so this talk uh, will be separated into two parts. So uh, in my part, I will talk about what we're doing right now uh, under a, a, a project uh, in Singapore. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's about a, a, a eight million project, uh, Singapore dollar. Uh, one US dollar is about 1.3, 1 1.4 Singapore dollar. So it's a, it's a, it's a big project. So I will talk about what we are doing right now, and Phil will talk about uh, the future, you know, what we are going to do uh, later. Okay, so that's the topic, towards the glass is free, 3D displays. Uh, so in our lab, we, we you know, we, we do a lot of things. So display is, is one part, so, uh, but we have one theme, okay? The theme is called energy photonics. So uh, we, 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 I mean, it's a, it's a catchy word that, uh, you know, climate change. So we, we, we summarize this theme to combat the climate change. So this is uh, energy photonics. So explanation about this. So efficient energy transfer between photon and electron is a bit far from what we're doing the signal processing, but uh, uh, it's, it's more uh, on the fundamental, more fundamental level. Uh, so in this theme, what we, one of the topic we're doing is the low power and high quality displays. So 3D uh, is characterized in this, in this part. Okay, this is very important because uh, uh, low power, you know, especially is important because every, every, uh, you know, every person, as long as you are alive, there will be displays working for you throughout your life, okay? 
So imagine, uh, you know, one panel costs how much powers, you will consume a lot of powers uh, just purely uh, used for this place, okay? Uh, power is one thing, okay? And the next, another thing is that we have to maintain the quality, okay? So that's why we call it uh, low power but high quality displays. So we also have uh, the Society for Energy Photonics, which I, I funded uh, uh, in Singapore to promote the research in this area. So this is uh, the outline, roughly. Uh, so uh, I will give a very brief introduction, and we talk about the various uh, displays that we are working right now in the lab, including the tensor display, the steering backlight, uh, 3D, uh, super multi view, and we, we also uh, use some 3D films, lenticular films for mobile devices, and making use of that to make some floating uh, image displays. Uh, display is very important uh, it, it, because the future is di display centric, be because no matter uh, uh, where we are, no matter when it is the time, you know, uh, uh, including everything, everybody, and for all, every purpose, okay, we, we are talking uh, around the display. Okay, so this, is, this, is, this image is uh, taken uh, uh, in 2013 uh, ICID uh, symposium. It's uh, uh, the Samsung CEO, his, uh, his presentation. So the future is the display-centric world. Uh, and, okay, naturally 3D will be, be the future because uh, our eyes, uh, you know, will see naturally 3D things in 3D, okay. Uh, this is just some of the, uh, uh, what we think the, the future requirement for 3Ds, okay. You, we would to have less crosstalks, let, let you can see from A, and, um, uh, uh, and, and you know, this, uh, there's three different kind of uh, requirement, the essential requirement, advanced requirement, and ultimate requirement, okay. Um, uh, we should get rid of the, the, the AC conflict, okay, accommodation convergence conflict. We should uh, uh, generate the so-called uh, super multi-view, uh, like the C shown here, that uh, uh, when the view is very narrow and filled with the whole space, uh, then we'll sh it, it, it's, it's the same like a light field display, okay. Um, and of course, the ultimate uh, uh, expectation will be similar like the D. You can generate a, a, a very large uh, viewing zone, okay, uh, filled with so many fine, uh, discrete uh, views. I, I can see that a lot of uh, uh, demos have shown that, uh, like uh, uh, holographic, uh, you know, they are all trying to go into all this direction. But another thing is that I feel we, we need to make it cheap enough to, to, for people to be able to afford to buy it. Um, so one of the, the display we do is a tensor display. So this, we, we use a multi-layer LCDs to stack them together. Um, um, okay, of course we need the source. So this is uh, just showing that the five by five uh, sources through the computation uh, 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 optimization, we, we are able to, to generate uh, a good, a reasonably good, reasonably good 3D. So this is what we have done. Uh, uh, so those 25 images are, are viewing basically for the light field optimization, optimization zone. But there are other zones which are not optimized. So, so what we do is to add a weightage factor to optimize uh, uh, this, this other zones as well. So this is a displaying effect. So without doing the optimization for the other zones and with the uh, optimization of the other zones. Um, these are some of the, the videos that we have done. So this is for, for a, a car. This is from the MIT's uh, uh, database. Uh, you can see this is for a still image. Uh, Okay, we also uh, did some, uh, uh, you know, for the, the motion, uh, motion image, but, but as you can see, a lot of, uh, still a lot of uh, artifacts uh, generated. And because this need a lot of computation power, so we use GPU, but uh, it's uh, for this simple uh, um, 
image, uh, but for my very complicated image, uh, we still uh, cannot do it. Uh, the next is uh, steering 3D display with eye tracking. So this was uh, previously uh, a European product done by Phil in, in UK. So this is a setup. Uh, so we have uh, the projector here, which is uh, the, the light source. And uh, uh, it will be, uh, uh, you know, generate the, the backlight pattern uh, uh, by those uh, array of uh, lenses. Then this will be fit into the LCD screen uh, for, for left and right eyes, OK? So what we have developed further is that uh, with uh, Kinect uh, eye tracking uh, and also with, uh, with a 3D uh, camera and uh, in situ capture the object, so when the viewers uh, are viewing uh, around the display, so the Kinect sends the, the viewer's motion and, uh, and, and, and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, changing the position of the, the capture. So it is on a track, so we, we're actually seeing the different perspectives of that uh, object being captured. So this is just uh, sh showing that uh, 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 the left and right eye, uh, you know, images. One is red, one is green. So we can see that's not so much crosstalk. And this bottom image shows that uh, uh, there is a, a small toy over there. The viewer is uh, viewing that small toy. So when he look, changes viewing directions, actually the capture is in situ. It will show later on that uh, uh, it is uh, the, the the camera is moving on a track to to look at different perspectives of that, that object. So, so over there, that uh, uh, camera is, uh, is rotating, uh, corresponding to the position of the, the, pers the, the viewer. OK, another thing that we have developed uh, is, is the so-called super multi-view. So, uh, so in this case, we have to employ the so-called spatial temporal multiplexing because uh, we, we, we basically the, the resolution is, uh, is not that high. We cannot uh, you know, uh, sacrifice too much on that. So we have to apply the temporal multiplexing together with the spatial multiplexing to generate the super multi-views. Okay. So uh, to do that, what we, we intend to do is uh, with the monitor plus the lenticular lens which that will sacrifice the spatial resolution, and then we plus a steering screen. So that will give us the temporal uh, multiplexing. So this is uh, the basic principle. So basically, we want to generate very narrow views, uh, as narrow as, as the half of our pupil size. In this way, we will be able to overcome the AC conflict completely. So, so I think Phil will, will further mention on this. Uh, so this is what we have. We, we use the existing uh, ASUS uh, 144 hertz monitor. This is what we have, uh, fasted dis uh, display monitor on the market. So uh, we arrange the pixels in this way, and uh, 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 it, will, it will give us uh, 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 three times of temporal uh, multi uh, um, uh, You know, we, we need three times of temporal multiplex, okay? To, to, to generate uh, nine views. So this will give us uh, three view, um, three basic views, and then we'll add in uh, six uh, uh, temporal views. So totally, we'll have nine views. So this is uh, under development. As you can see, this is uh, uh, with, with a, a lenticular lens screen that we can uh, generate all these uh, nine, uh, uh, nine views according to that. Uh, this is a steering screen, just a, just, just a demonstration of uh, steering that uh, uh, images. But again, they we have uh, uh, still a lot of you know long distance to go to make it a, a real demo. Uh, so another thing which is more close to the market is uh, lenticular lens type of displays. Okay, so um, so this is uh, uh, working with a company. We have a five view. 3D films uh, put on iPhones, put on this iPad, those kind of uh, uh, smart displays. Uh, 
uh, mobile displays. Uh, so this is this is uh, the, the, the the film. Uh, uh, it's 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 not bad when, because uh, the hand phone right now they have very high resolution. So even if you lose some spatial resolution, you still feel it's uh, it's very good. Um, so making use of that, we we just uh, uh, you know make some very uh, simple optics. Uh, you know the student tried to play uh, made some uh, you know so called. Uh, 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 floating 3D. Basically, uh, you look at the display uh, from the front and you, you steer it uh, from the side. You'll see the side uh, image of this uh, dancer and then you go back and see the back. Okay, so it, it, it's all around. Uh, okay, so, so that's, that's all of my part. So I will invite uh, Phil and <laughs> I'm bringing him. So, <laughs> so, so, so this a project supported by uh, uh, by National Research Foundation uh, of Singapore, and uh, especially thanks to to Phil because uh, you know he is uh, is uh, the key person working on this project, and we also have a few other guys uh, listed below. So so thank you. That's that's my part. Uh, Phil will talk about the future. Okay, right, I'll, um, I'll just go briefly through um, our project is the, uh, our remit is to produce a glasses free uh, 3D. So we decide there's sort of three basic ways we can do it. So computational multi-layer, that's the, uh, uh, based on the MIT system, uh, head tracked and super multi-view. Well, I'll, Gloss over the first ones, I think, because Shaway's already covered that, so he's shown this already. Um, so I think what's of particular interest here is the super multi view. Now, currently, most super multi views are based on the sort of holographic principle with, say, multiple projectors and a vertically diffusing screen. Um, as you can see, they're very large, and what we want to do is can we compress this into something, say, less than a centimetre deep? That's quite a challenge. So, first thing we have to do is we haven't got the luxury of vertical parallax. So that's, you know, although it's nice to have it, um, we're, we're into displays and we just can't do it. So, there's no arguments about this. Um, so, the idea is that we, instead of having these massive, great structures, we can compress the whole thing so every pixel will be a tiny projector that can give it a different beam of light in different vertical directions. So, that's our aim. So, what I'd say is, um, we talk about super multi-view, and that's a multi-view with a large number of views. Well, my contention is that really, um, what is the difference between integral imaging, or say, light field display, and a multi-view with a very large number of views? Because if you look, the image region, the light blue region, is close to the screen. Now, you get better depth if you've got high angular resolution. Well, that relates to number of viewing zones. If you've got a, a super multi with a large number of viewing zones, say 100 or more, that represent, represents a, really a light field display. And I don't believe there's any difference. So we can produce lots of views. We've got a light field display in effect. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry about this. Sorry about that. Um, so I think um, depth in a 3D display is all down to angular resolution. That's what we need to achieve, high angular resolution. So I'll just turn this off so it's my wife phoning. Um, so it's just an example. You can see that as the number of views goes up, um, the dark region represents, say, the usable area of the viewing region. So 
As the number of views goes up, you see that your viewing space comes way out of the screen. The current, say, eight or nine view displays, you see the depth that can come out of the screen is very small. And I don't think that's acceptable. I think we need to have proper depth. So, I mean, we do need a large number of views. And the way I look at it in sort of intuitive sort of way is that you've got effectively like voxels formed by the crossing of these, if you like, we've got discrete images here. I mean, it won't be quite like that in practice. So the further you come away from the screen, these voxels get longer, effectively. So this sort of intuitive way of saying, well, the more views, the more depth we can come out of the screen. So this is interesting. We got this from TP Vision. Um, a couple of years ago, they gave us this information, the effective depth of field of a, this is a nine view display. So you, you start off with a 4K display, and you make it into a, a nine view with a slanted lenticular. So straight away, you're down to about 1300 effective pixels across the screen. So there's your loss, your, your spatial loss to start with. As you come out from the screen, say, up to 300 millimetres, which isn't a great deal. Your resolution drops to about 300, so that is really crap depth of field. So this is why I think manufacturers, I mean, with 4K displays, manufacturers could produce slanted lenticulars, but it's not done. And I think they don't perceive these being good enough to serve the public you know, for a consumer product. And um, here's the effect. This is taken from... Atanas's um, thesis, but this shows the effect of, um, if you like, the low spatial or angular resolution of um, a multi-view display. You get these multiple edges formed that effectively gives you a blurred image as you come away from the screen. These edges get further and further apart, so that's how it affects current multi-view displays. And Shawa said, um, you know, we, we need the high angular resolution, the large number of views. Whether we can ever achieve this, you know, say two views per pupil, I'm not sure. But that's what we can aspire to. But the more views, the better. That's the way I look at it. And if you look at the plan of the viewing regions, it's taken from an interesting, very good paper, this workshop on uh, 3D imaging. That the usable viewing region is shown by this dotted blue line. And when you're at the optimum viewing distance, you get, say, a separate image in each eye. As you come, say, forward or away from it, you'll actually see parts of more than one image, generally three or five images of, across the screen as you come further away from the optimum viewing distances. Um, so you get sort of image shearing across the screen. But the more views you have, the smaller the difference between these adjacent views. So there's another reason for choosing a high number of views in the display. So where we want to go is a spatial temporal multiplexing. You can't cram, say we need 100 million or more than that, um, pixels, you can't get all those onto a, a current display. So I think we've got to go to spatial temporal multiplexing. Now, here's an example. If you wanted, say, integral imaging with sort of eight views across, so, and which doesn't give, oh, sorry, 16 views across, doesn't give very good depth but you'd need 256 pixels behind each lens. So you could then go to a 16 view, full horizontal parallax. You'd need pixels arranged like that. That would still be very difficult. If you're going to say 100 views or more than 100 views, how physically are you going to make that? So the other answer is to have, say, pixel like this, that you can then address, I mean, you, you, this would be impossible to address, you know, the, the sort of parasitic capacities, you know, it'd just be impossible. But if we can, I mean, this is where we're going to liaise with um, manufacturers. If we can get a, a fast display of pixels like that, we can effectively fill these spaces in um, with the steering screen that's mentioned earlier. So um, it seems a feasible way of getting a lot of views so here's the steering screen. So what we have, this would be the example of a 16 view display. So we'd have these narrow viewing zones with gaps in between. So what we do is fill those in in time with the steering screen. So here's a, a, a very fast OLED display that we're going to get our hands on um, from a manufacturer in China. And we've got access right to the glass so we can then run that thing fast. If you take, say, 
um, display out of a phone, you can only run up to 80 hertz and they, that's it. You're limited by the, the driver. There's chip on glass, there's nothing you can do. This way we can, we've got a display that um, they say can run up to about a kilohertz. So we're now talking about serious temporal multiplexing. So just quickly, I'm taking a different approach to what's being done here. My idea is that we catch the images with a dense camera array and this, um, you know, we've been forced by necessity to do this, so we've got a dense camera array. We apply a depth map to it, so here's our temporal multiplex. It's a time one, you, you've got frame buffers, say four frame buffers, you, you write the whole buffer. Then with a the depth map, if you've got an image where, say, there's a, a sphere sticking right out in front of a background, all you do is update those areas. At time two, you update a bigger area. But the, the upshot is you don't have to update the whole of the frame buffer every time. So this way, um, by using a depth map, and it's a three-dimensional depth map, um, so there's a depth map for each line. So here's, the, here's a view of three spheres. There's two planes for x, x and y, y. So you get this depth map here. So what, being spatial temporal multiplexing, these regions represented by four could be, say, updated at um, fast refresh rate, say 240 hertz. These at just 60 hertz, for example. So the upshot of this is that you can actually um, compress that you know, you're handling a lot less data, but in an absolutely lossless way, and you capture all the information. So what you do is reject it right at the camera output, so um, you don't have to handle any sort of large amounts of information. That's a lot of time now. So that's how depth maps derive. So there isn't time to explain it now. We're running a bit short on time. Um, with the camera away, we can sort of program it so that we can do the, the depth of field, the convergence. This would be the idea. So with a fixed array of say inexpensive cameras, dense array, we can then operate on the images to effectively focus them or converge them. We can calibrate it that way. We can choose a depth of field by which cameras. We could say, choose things coming out of the screen, um, give them a high angular resolution so that they're sharp, anything behind the screen, then we could say, well, don't catch it on all the cameras. We can actually do it on the fly. So it's very flexible. Where this works out in the more well, for like subtle image processing methods, I don't know, but it's a practical approach for us because we've got the problem of having to build a display, a system. So our research basically is we've got the devices, which is a steering screen, which is difficult. We've got to steer fairly quickly. A fast OLED, and in parallel, that we're building a nine view, a very crude nine view system. So we're attacking sort of both sides of the problem. We're going to learn a lot just in this very um, crude nine view system, where the depth map would just say something is near or far. But we'll learn a lot on the way from that. So that's my last slide. So. Questions actually, we are running very much behind the schedule, so I will encourage you to ask Phil whatever questions offline after the meeting. And then we are going to have our uh, last presentation. It comes from uh, the uh, Center for Genomic Regulation from Barcelona, Spain. And it's about biological imaging in the same center. So uh, with this presentation, we try to somehow explore um, uh, more professional or more application-oriented uh, applications of the full parallax imaging, which we want to develop within the network. So I give the floor to Jim Swogger from the center, please welcome. Thanks. Um, thanks for inviting me. I'm going to feel a little left out here, I think. We're not doing quite the same thing. Um, we're trying to do 3D imaging 
<clears throat> the display stuff is really beyond us. If I could display some of the wonderful ways you guys have shown so far, it'd be great. But things like this are just plain old projections through our sample. So what I'm going to talk about is the, the acquisition of the data that we've got. And the title is a little misleading. There's hundreds of people at our institute, the CRG. I'm just going to talk about what we're doing in our lab, because that's what's going to be relevant for the uh, consortium. So just briefly, what are we interested in? Um, electron microscopy is really not suitable for the scales that we're looking at. And similar, you know, whole human things like MRI are not it. Um, there's nothing wrong with these techniques. They're wonderful if that's what you want. But what we're really focusing on is this sort of what we call mesoscopic scale samples in this kind of scale, <coughs> sorry, samples in this kind of size. What, <coughs> sorry. What we would like to see would be cellular details throughout intact organs or organisms. It's not that we can always see that, but that's sort of our, the goal towards which we're working. And the techniques that we're developing, the tools are um, SPIM and OPT, which I will discuss today mostly OPT because I think it's a little more closely related to what goes on here. Um, <clears throat> a bit at the beginning, because you're probably not used to look at these sort of samples, everything I'm going to show you is on cleared samples, which are dead and fixed. The techniques can work on live samples as well, but the data I'm going to show is on these fixed samples, and you'll see why in this slide. This little thing here is a mouse embryo. It's embedded in a block of agarose, and here it's in a vial of water. We take that, replace the water with methanol, and the thing looks something like this. You can see it's even actually a little less transparent at this stage. But the nice thing you can do is replace that methanol with benzyl alcohol, benzyl benzoate, and your sample looks like this or rather it doesn't look like anything. Um, if you zoom in on it, again, there's the mouse embryo here, here. If you look really closely, you can see the eyes. The pigmentation isn't cleared, but all of the soft tissue basically is index matched uh, to this embedding medium. So you can take some really nice images because, of course, the samples are very transparent. The downside is, of course, that they're very dead as well. This, you can't do dynamics in this kind of uh, situation. So optical projection tomography is one technique we've been developing in the lab. Um, at least conceptually, it's quite similar to X-ray CT. Uh, we have a, a source of light, a lamp, white lamp in this case. Um, we have a sample that we put in front of our lamp. Um, unlike X-ray CT, we have nice optics that work at visible wavelengths, so we can put in some image, image, uh, lenses to form an image on the screen. So we turn on the lamp, light goes through the system, and we get an image of our sample here. Um, this schematic is just a wide field transmission microscope. The main difference is that we add a rotation stage to the thing, so we can turn the sample around, image it from multiple directions, and collect 360 degrees worth of views of the sample. Um, that in itself is kind of interesting. This is a, a view of a mouse spleen. Um, I just invert the contrast because it helps with the explanation a bit. You've got your 360 degree views that we take of that, which is kind of nice for visualizing, but it's not what we really want. Um, so we do a reconstruction. If we just take one plane there, you can consider the intensity amplitude along that line. And what we do is we back project that virtually um, in the computer. So sort of take that and stretch it back through. That by itself is completely useless, but we don't just have one view. We have views from many different angles. <coughs> so we take those and we start combining them together. And you can see that the more views we add in, it takes a little while to build up. But you actually end up getting quite a nice cross-section along that yellow line of the 
a thin section of the sample. And of course, you can do that for all of the planes in the thing, and then you have a nice voxel data sketch where you can scan through. These are just different reconstructed slices moving through the uh, spleen. This uh, works in transmission. You can also do it in fluorescence, just replacing that lamp we had there with a, a UV lamp for exciting fluorescence, some filters so that we can get the excitation light onto the sample, and uh, filters, again, for detecting the light coming out. We get a nice fluorescence image of our sample. We can rotate it again and do exactly the same sort of process of uh, reconstruction. Um, I guess the point here is that we can do both of these things, the transmission and the fluorescence contrast. We get the nice reconstructed data sets that are co-aligned to each other. Um, so it gives us these, this multimodal type of imaging. Um, now, the reason we're doing this, the technique was developed uh, in Edinburgh, and we've brought it to Barcelona with us, is because we want to study in the lab mouse limb development. It's a biology lab, not really an optics lab. Um, sort of a, a sideline. In limb development, in a space of about 36 hours, this is a mouse, you go from a small, more or less amorphous blob with no structure into it to this sort of thing that's starting to resemble an arm with a hand coming out. Um, so we, we want to study how do you go from such a simple thing to a complex string thing. You've got this sort of emergent properties of the biology. And there's a lot of things that are going on. Patterning, morphogenesis, differentiation, mechanics all have to go into this sort of thing. Um, what we'd like to be able to do is model the growth of this limb bud in the computer. So ideally, we would start with a, an, an initial condition, that limb bud I had over here, which wasn't differentiated, and um, computationally model how it develops, how it grows in the computer. So we start an initial condition with the finite element model. We can sort of see how it will grow over time. And if we can do that and we can get it to work properly, we get the feeling we understand what's going on. To do that, we're going to need a lot of data. We need spatial quantification of things like gene expression patterns, growth rates, the actual shape of the limb. So that's why we're doing this sort of 3D imaging. Um, this is just one part of what we need to collect. But uh, the standard method for looking at gene expression is doing RNA in situs, which basically put a, a, a dark stain in the sample where the RNA for a given gene is expressed. So this is too small to see much, but you'll get the idea in a moment. This is a limb bud at a certain stage expressing, the, uh, well, labeled for the gene HOXD9. What we'd like to see is this sort of thing over many time points at different developmental stages and uh, for many different genes. And of course, these are just 2D images. What we want is the 3D. Um, as I said, we, to get these nice images, we have to clear the samples so they're dead. So what we're doing here is actually looking at different embryos. These are supposed to be turning, but you get the idea. It's 3D data showing the different gene expressions. This one is expressed mostly here in the spine here in a couple spots there. We build up a library of these uh, structures at different points in time. Um, so now this is zooming in on a limb bud. This is the transmission image. There was an in situ staining for HOXA11 in this case, which is this dark stain here. Um, just to invert the contrast again, because it's easier to show things. This is. So this is the transmission data. This is the autofluorescence of it, just coming out what shows up in the fluorescence channel. And um, you can overlay them. So you're getting a nice idea of the, the registered data that you can see where the gene is expressed, and you can see the morphology of the limb. Um, these are the raw projections. These are, hopefully, slices through the 3D reconstructions of the voxel data set. And I have to hurry along. Um, 
I think I will just skip this. We can use this to correct these holes here computationally, but I won't go into the details of that. Um, so yeah, what we want to do for the modeling, we require the uh, 4D gene expression patterns, which we can get from our transmission data sets. We want the morphology, which we can get from the uh, autofluorescence, and it's nicer once we do this correction. And we also need a lot more that I haven't gone into, but to do the modeling, um, it's more than just the gene expression and the morphology. And I will skip this one for time's sake. The other technique we, ah, no, summary, I'll also skip this because of a little bit of summary at the end. The other technique we're using is the light sheet microscopy spin. This only works in fluorescence. The idea is really simple. You have a light sheet, you have a imaging system, this is just an objective lens with a camera behind it. You focus on the light sheet, you put a sample in there. Um, it's attached to a stage, so we can rotate it to look at it from different directions and scan it in three dimensions. And um, we have some kind of a chamber, so if it's live, we can have a nice medium in there to keep it happy. Um, the real advantage to this over OPT is that because we're taking just images of a single plane at a time, we can do tiling. We can zoom in at high resolution and then take many tiles over the sample to get a really high resolution data set. This is a schematic, uh, schematic of the setup, which again, I won't go into. And the, uh, well, this is what it looks like. It's a benchtop system with various different components on it. Um, this is a sample of the head of a mouse embryo that we scanned in the system. The, you can see the eyes here are in white. Those were done in absorption contrast with the OPT. And the, f the rest, the colors are fluorescence, um, two orthogonal views of the thing. Uh, the nice thing about this is, like, as I said, with the spin, you can really zoom in at high resolution and look at the fine details of these nerves in the, in the face of the mouse. Um, and I'm zooming back out. So what the system delivers is basically this high-resolution, co-registered, multimodal data, data. These are, again, max projections in two dimensions, but it's all 3D data in the end. So just to summarize, the OPT, uh, we get our 3D uh, information from the back projection algorithm. Gives us both transmission and fluorescence, and those are sort of um, useful together, not just two separate things. The spin um, gives us, the light sheet is what gives us our 3D uh, imaging capability. And the combination of the two gives us this sort of multimodal uh, imaging that allows us to get the best parts of both of them. Uh, and in the end, we can get sort of micron scale resolution and millimeter size samples. That was about four or five millimeters top to bottom. Uh, so just the acknowledgments. Of, I'm in James Sharp's lab at the CRG. Jurgen Meyer is a very good student who's defending his PhD in a couple of weeks, and he's done a lot of the actual work here. This mouse embryo came from a collaborator in Paris, and uh, of course the funding. So that's it. I would take questions, but there's probably no time. So. Thanks for having me here. Thank you very much. Yes, quick question maybe. Uh, you assume that everything is transparent. Is that the case in the embryo stage? So it's not. I was going to go into that. I didn't have time. The first movie I showed on the slide, it was fluorescence. And you can really see as the thing turns around, it's occluded by things. In that case, it was actually with bone and hard tissue, which isn't cleared by this. In this also, you can see, if you know your anatomy well, you can see that there are artifacts in that. Those eyes with the pigment cast shadows in the fluorescence imaging. So I didn't have time to go into it. We're trying to correct that, but it is an issue. Uh, so we rotate about one axis by 360 degrees. 
this is just virtually rotated afterwards, the, this one. So once we have the voxel data, we can do whatever we want with it. Yes, so X, Y, Z coordinates of each pixel. It's just really hard to show the voxel data in a meaningful way. Thank you. Okay, if not more questions, we are 20 minutes late, which only demonstrates that the workshop was very interesting. <laughs> and uh, I hope the presentations were uh, instructive for you, what we aim at doing. Sorry, now it should work better. So I would like to uh, thank the uh, presenters. They did very, very good job in presenting the aim of the uh, network, of the European Training Network on Full Parallax, parallax, parallax Imaging. And also to help the audience for the interesting questions and uh, your attendance. And we are looking forward to doing excellent research and training new doctoral students on the white area for parallax, parallax imaging. Thank you very much, and see you in some other interesting events. Thank you.